So I'm joined tonight with Bob Eden. Bob's reached out by email and I've read through some of his material based on the gift of progression. And it's something that really struck a chord with me because I, I do talk a lot myself about the gift that is any challenge and particularly depression is something I've been through a lot of myself in the past. And I thought what a great opportunity to have someone come on and share, you know, their experiences with it over a long period of time and, and what it all means. And, and I think there's a lot of people that will get a lot out of this, especially at this point in time. So uh, Bob, welcome. Thanks for the chat. You want to just fill everybody in on a little bit about who you are and what brought you here? Um, what brought me here is following my heart. Um, it's been a, just one synchronicity after another. Um, yeah. That's all I can say, really, um, about me. I'm, I'm 68 and going great. Um, I probably woke up in 1990, but, um, yeah, I've done a lot of intensive personal growth work. But, you know, why am I here? Why, why am I here? Well, every 40 seconds, somebody dies because of depression. That's over 700,000 people a year. And it's probably more now. And and I know the pain of depression because I've been there. And if, and if just by sharing my story, I can save one life, then it's all worthwhile. Mm. So I think the best thing to do is just share my story. And then um, it's only about two and a half pages. So if any questions, uh, uh, hold on to them till I finish the story, if that's okay, Tom. Yeah, let's go. Let's do it. Thanks, mate. My story, The Wounds and Lessons of a Childhood. I was born in England, very premature and delivered by a cesarean section. My mother never forgave me for the scar on her belly. I was about two pounds at birth and was not expected to live. But I did, I'm a survivor. I'm not sure I chose my family. Mum was prone to violent hour bursts of rage so if I got in range I got hit whether I was you know being good or bad so basically I got the crap beaten out of me for many years and also I just remembered this one mum was a refugee from Germany I was born in England she sent me to school at the age of five years old dressed in lederhosen with a crew cut so I got the crap beaten out of me at school as well so there was there was no safe place for me anyway right so the message I got from mum was, mum is always beating me, therefore she does not love me, therefore I'm unlovable and it's all my fault. And the second message was, and the world's a dangerous place because I was always getting beaten. And then um, dad, who was a workaholic, he was a mythical creature, you know, he went to work before I got up and he came home after I went to bed. So the message I got from dad was, uh, Dad never spends any time with me, therefore he does not love me, therefore I'm unlovable and it's all my fault. And so I spent all my childhood years in that flight, fight and flight mode, you know, hiding in the air in cupboard. And, and yeah, and I became the people pleaser to take the attention off my dysfunctional family. Anyway, uh, when I was about six years old, Dad finally had a nervous breakdown and he commit himself to a mental hospital in, um, in England. And, and I didn't see him again until I was about 10 or 11. And by which time he was institutionalized, just wandering around muttering, try him on my gut till let's sever his front lobes. You know, it just the stuff that the doctor, he didn't need ECT. He just needed a bloody holiday, mm. but he was, you know, anyway, to take the spotlight off my crazy family, Mum a rageaholic and dad a workaholic, I became the people pleaser and I totally abandoned my needs to please others. And that's a habit I took way too long into adulthood. When I, was, when I was about three, it felt like somebody had given a wheelbarrow. So I started pushing it. I was young and strong, so it was okay. But as I moved through life, more junk was dumped into it, like my childhood abuse, my socio-cultural conditioning the indoctrination of the education system and all the rest of our society's constraints until such time as it got too heavy to push anymore. That time was 1984, an interesting date, when at 3 a.m. I had my first panic attack and I just woke up 
and my arms and legs were just going everywhere and it frightened the crap out of my wife and I wasn't too pleased for that either. <laughs> What's going on here? <sighs> anyway, that's that was my suffering from depression. So I went to see the doctor. It was a great doctor. He delivered my son, you know, but he put me on some benzodiazepines or something. Um, and that was it. That began a cycle of medications that went on for over 20 years. Anyway, I'll move along. Uh, I, had a, I was working for ESSO in research in the UK. I've got an amazing intellect, you know, and that's a blessing and a curse. Um, so I was working for ESSO in research. Great job. Beautiful wife, two kids, two-story house, holidays in France. I was living the magazine life, the dream life, you know. What, what's going on? What's going on? Ah, oh, dear. So skipping back to my childhood to keep things chronological, when did I first start disbelieving in me? And my earliest recollection was I was about four and three quarter years old and I got up, it was a Sunday morning, I brushed my teeth and combed my hair and put my red t-shirt on and bounced down at breakfast and mum said, Bobby, go up and put your blue t-shirt on because you know you love your blue t-shirt. So I stood up confused. But now I love me red t-shirt. But mum must be right, because she's mum. And I mustn't make her angry. She's very violent. And after all, she's, you know, like 80 foot tall. You know? <laughs> and she is mum. And that's my earliest recollection of when I stopped believing in myself. And that became a habit that just extrapolated. And there's a reason for sharing that. Because um, later on in the story, you'll find out. So how do I dig? myself out of this hole. When my family and I emigrated to Australia, November 89, and um, I stayed and they went back. <laughs> and that that's maybe sound glib, but Pan and I, we were, after working so hard for 13 years, we just become strangers. We never shared our truth with each other. We were always polite, so nothing ever got resolved. So after after 13 years, we, we'd started to snap at each other, you know, and the writing was on the wall. We'd just done a geographical, you know. So we sat down and um, decided, you know, I said, Pam, take what you want, you know, but I'm staying. I knew in my heart that I had to stay here. So Pam, the furniture never got out of the container. <laughs> so Pam went back took the kids, <clears throat> went back to England, got into business with her sister in a bed and breakfast place in a seaside town. So she had a house that brought in an income and she, she did a great job. Uh, anyway, yeah. I must have cried for about six months, but I had great support for, from friends I met in the folk scene in Perth. I got a job in automotive research and started rebuilding, but still with the old survival behaviors in place. My intellect was having a ball working in research and I was developing a following in the folk scene and playing in many bands in and around Perth and Frio and began touring in, in WA when work permitted. But my heart was heavy and I was still fighting with depression. It would be many years before I turned that fight into a dance. Living in Frio, excuse me, I got involved in personal growth and I was living in Ray Avenue uh, with my partner who eventually became a psychologist and that was the end of that relationship. But we, we, actually, we actually had a sweat lodge in the back garden, you know, not bad for a fit attorney having a sweat lodge in the back garden. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. So I got involved in personal growth and the first program I entered was a 12 step program adult children of absent parents. And that was great, you know, that, that gave me some guidance. But when it got to the stage where I now have to hand over responsibility to God, I knew that was a parting of the ways because I knew it was my job to fix me. You know, just somewhere in here, it was my job to fix me. And next I did a course in anger management because mum had all the anger, so I never learned how to deal with it. 
about 1993, I came across John Bradshaw and his work on the inner child. And that this guy saved my life. He's, he's moved on now, he's, he's deceased. But um, yeah, his work on the inner child and family of origin was so impressed that with my partner, we bought all his tapes and used to run weekly sessions for people. So this, you know, after a few months, this stuff really got ingrained and I was living it in, and, oh dear. John's work opened the floodgates for me as I began to understand what my dysfunctional childhood had produced. And I suppose it was at this time I started to develop my sense of noticing or awareness. Depression was still rolling in and out. And then one day I realized that medication only lasts for a couple of months and then produces the same symptoms it's supposed to cure. And with my continued research into depression and mental illness, I realized that not one psychologist or psychiatrist has ever claimed to have cured anyone. And just as my own personal observation, like psychiatrists gives you pills to medicate the pain and so psychologists teach you coping skills so you can live with the pain. But no, I didn't want to, I didn't want to, you know, live that way. And I think it was Jesse Green uh, in Freo that gave me this phrase, if you don't hand it back, you pass it on. So I let that bubble for a while. And here's the big one. Here's the big one. This is the biggest thing I've ever done. I let that phrase bubble for a while. And then that one day I sat down and I wrote the letter to mum. Dear mum, I'm writing to tell you how it felt for me growing up in our family. This is not about blame. Just telling you my story. Look forward to hearing yours, your loving son, Bob. And so I sat down and wrote and wrote about how I hated being hit with the frying pan, how I hated being dangled by my wrist and hit with a carpet sweeper, how she never came to school sports days, how she kept reminding me of the scar on her belly. Anyway, what I thought would be one or two pages ended up being war and peace. <laughs> It's the longest thing I've ever written in my life. Anyway, so I signed it, your loving son, Bob, and then I posted it to her in England, you know, and that's the hardest thing that I've ever done is post that letter to mum. Eventually, I got a letter back from mum saying, uh, uh, I'm so sorry, Bobby. You must think I'm the first mother in the whole world, but I was only doing my best. And I wrote back and said, Mum, this is not about blame. This is about me telling you my story. Tell me your story. Because in my own journey, I got to that place where, God, I hate you, Mum. You're always beating me, but you've got to love your Mum. And it was that quandary that was ripping my soul apart. Yeah. So eventually I got a letter back from Mum. She was born in Germany in 24, between the wars. Her dad was an alcoholic and mum was a control freak. There's all this. She had a shit childhood too. And that's when the light bulb went off. Yes, mum was doing her very, very best. And all she was doing was dumping on me what got dumped on her. And so through her sharing her story, I could move from that place of hate through understanding back to love. And a couple of days later, I found her... Uh, in England, and she was back in hospital with a second incidence of bowel cancer, 20 years apart. And I managed to get through to her at the St. John's Hospital. And that was the first time we ever spoke as mother and son, as two adults. And we're both crying our eyes out, you know. Um, and then the following day, she died. Now, what a beautiful closure. Mm. Now, I'm walking around like somebody's taking an elephant off my shoulders. And like, oh... Hey, hang on, what's this? There's still a niggle up here, there's still a niggle. Right, dad, you bastard. So I got, <laughs> I got the notepad out and wrote a, a, a similar letter to dad, you know. Why didn't you come to school sports days? Why didn't you never, ever play with me, you know? But he had already died, so I just wrote it, put it in an envelope to dad in heaven and, and burnt it. And in that way, I healed the wounds of my childhood, but also broke the multi-generational cycle of abuse. Now, as a caveat to my mum's story, uh, about 18 months ago, 
I contacted mum through a medium who shared stuff with me that I knew was, you know, fair dinkum, only stuff that mum and I would know. And mum was crying her eyes out and saying, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for writing that letter because she's now going through that process in the beyond with her parents back down healing the, you know, the line. And that just, that just absolutely blew me away. Oh, oh dear. Right. Oh. I think it was 1995 or 96. My mind was having a ball, but my soul was crying. Depression was still ruling the roost. I was performing at Araluen Festival and there was a combi for sale. So I bought it for three grand, got it back home, put it in a pop top and set it up for the mobile life. And I went to my boss and said, Chris, I fear that if I lose this job, I'll die. So I quit. And he was aware of my state of dis-ease. But his reply was great. He said, yeah, Bob, I kind of get that. So I put the house on the market and got rid of anything that would not suit the combi life. And the first thing to go was the bloody television. And there was no room for a TV. So that was the first thing to go. <coughs> and then <coughs> what I couldn't sell, I gave away. And I realized about 35 grand from the center of the house. And that funded my first tour of the festivals around Australia. And I used to get there about a week early, become a volunteer, help build the festival, and in the evening sit down and share the music I love with the people that organized it. And so next year, you know, when I applied, I got 100% strike rate. Everybody booked me. And so it became a, you know, a self-funding self -funding, uh, episode. And I actually performed at Woodford Festival every year from 2000 to 2006. So that's uh, a claim to fame. Yeah, so where do we go from here? Right. Yeah, so eventually that ended up me living out of my combi for 10 years, um, going around Australia eight times, you know, and I've got some memories. And you said something the other day about musicians. I've met mu world-class musicians, you know, around the campfire, and they only come out around the campfire. You know, they're usually sitting at home playing in their kitchens. I know guitar is better than Carlos Santana, you know. Yeah, but they're... They don't get famous because they don't want to, because they, they, it's their passion, you know. They haven't turned their, their passion into a job. Right, I was kind of close up with my story now. So, in 2005, I became, I got my Master Fire qualification and became a ship's captain, you know, master and commander. Mm -hmm. And I was watching that Russell Crowe movie, that Master and Commander. And the first time I took a boat out of that, by the Bob, the buck stops with you. You are responsible for the lives of these people. The vibe on the boat, everything, it stops with you. Not, not like that bloody Dan Andrews in Victoria denies all responsible. But I won't go there. <coughs> so all I did, Tom, was I took that ideology and applied it to my own life. Right. I am master and commander of my life, and I take full responsibility for this life that I do create. And so I thought, right, as master and commander, what's my life purpose? So I set it. So I set my life purpose to be, to simply find my own truth. And how do I know what's my truth? Whatever resonates with my heart. So boom, I got the big one out of the way. I've got my life purpose. And then as a spiritual being, having a physical experience, I thought, well, how do I want to experience this life? So I set my own conscious life intention, which is, I am here to have a gentle, joyful, loving, healthy, and abundant life. Now that here to, I'm here to have, that's my direct command to the universe, but also my address. So the universe knows where to deliver. And honestly, Tom, ever since I put that in place, about seven, six or seven years ago. That's precisely how my life is unfolding. That's precisely how my life is unfolding. And another leap of faith, as I said, I've faced my own death many times, not because I'm some weird thrill seeker, 
But I was on my boat in Pioneer Bay and I lived on her for eight years. And it was about eight o'clock at night, probably about, this is about 2015. And the lights went dim. And I looked across at the voltmeter, 12.8 volts, and all that was cool. And I couldn't breathe, couldn't breathe. And just here, right on the edge of my vision was this black silky wispiness. And I thought, oh no, hello old friend. I thought, it's all, it's all over Red Rover, the Grim Reaper has come to grab me. So I just typed in the Facebook, I was on my dog's Facebook page. Um, if I don't post anything in the next half hour, I get volunteer marine rescue to come and get Barnaby. Because I, you know, I was afraid that, you know, if I died after he'd finished eating me, well, that he'd, he'd cark it too. Yeah. So I'm sitting there, and I don't know about you, like in these moments of near death, time is irrelevant. It seems to, to stretch and stretch. Mm. So I'm sitting there, sitting there, and I'm naked, living on a boat in the tropics, that's what you do. Well, I did anyway. And I could have, you know, called for an, an ambulance. Well, you know, could have sent a message, you know, get the, the ambos over here. But I just sat with my body, sat in my body there, stood up, walked up the companion way. I looked up at the sky and I could see two full moons. I'm in a bay surrounded by mangrove trees where crocodiles live. It's after dark and sharks feed. So by goodness, I just leapt into the ocean and then lay back like that, along like a big starfish, looking up at the sky, and all of a sudden I went, <laughs> oh, I don't think I coughed, but I started breathing again. And that was the night I consciously bet my life on trusting my intuition, my gut feeling. Yeah. So that's, that's pretty much my story. Um, if you've got any questions, fire away. Or otherwise, I'll just go and highlight some of the tools that are used. Yeah, well, I think there's two important things that I think people can gain out of that. One is that, uh, first of all, learning how to feel your body and your intuition is so important because so many people are so stuck in the head and it can rule their life and it can be literally, they can create a hell out of their life because of what they're doing with their mind. So um, maybe it doesn't need to be as drastic as jumping into a crocodile shark in fast of water, but, uh, but just taking that leap, that's the, that's the thing, you know, taking that leap because uh, you know, I've said to a lot of people, it's like, there's no, <clears throat> you're never going to have a yellow brick road paved out before you so that you can just walk and know exactly where to go. You have to, you have to take a leap of faith. And, and that's rewarded. And when you take it, then the bricks come under your feet, but they don't appear until you take the step. So I think that's, that was a fundamental part of, I really like that part. And the other part, Bob, was uh, where you mentioned that your mother started to, because people have this linearity concepts throughout life. And um, the thing is, when we start to heal things in our generational pattern or trauma or whatever, it goes back generations as well and i don't think people realize that that we sometimes have a role in our generational um you know progression in which we heal ourselves but through that we heal we heal many many generations back and and future as well and so like you said that that um cycle stopped with you but it also yeah. goes back and people i think that's something that a lot of people haven't come to understand yet is the linear concept is a real illusion and the past the present the future are actually one event pretty much happening simultaneously and, and that there's so much power in what you described. So that was brilliant. Yeah. Well, as I say, um, I never give advice and I'll tell you where I'm coming from. For me, all are Sue that's sovereign, unique and equal. So I repeat that sovereign, unique and equal mm -hmm. and everything else just flows from that for me. And for me, the universe operates under the KISS principle. Keep it simple, sovereign. And by sovereign, I just mean that I am my own kingdom. I am my own nation. I am responsible for me. Um, I think the biggest sickness in Western society is probably codependency. And if, if anybody wants to know what codependency is, just listen to any love song. That was another phase of work I went through. And... That was really hard because it's really insidious 
insidious. Um, but the first thing that I learned to do really was how to silence my mind. When I was working for Esso in research, my mind was like a tree full of chattering monkeys. But when I started my trip around Australia, I had Shakti Gawain's book and creative visualization. And I just came up with this, this little video, because I tend to work in videos in here. And it was like a James Bond movie. I was running down this underground tunnel with the fluorescent lights, big glass doors. They opened and I could hear the dark satanic hum of the hard drives of my mind. And over on the right hand wall, there was a big red switch. So I just ambled over there and somebody put up a health notice. Please be warned, thinking can seriously damage your health. So I just grabbed the switch and went go clunk, turned it off. And I kept playing that movie over and over and over again until this phrase popped out, which is, my mind is just a tool that I use when I choose, for I am so much more than my mind. And now I treat my mind like I treat Melanie, my little puppy dog. I say, come on, mind, go off and do some research on sonoluminescence or something and come back and report to me. So off my mind goes wagging its little tail because it has attention from the master and it comes back, reports to me and I pat it on the head. Thank you, mind. Here's a treat. Now back in your basket, I'll take you for a run tomorrow. And that's how I managed to silence my mind. And then once I managed to silence my mind, I could finally hear my heart. And this may sound weird, but I think you'll, you'll probably get it. Within the silence of my heart, I have found a place I call my knowing. And my knowing has no words. And it's through that place that I, that's through that place is my connection to source. And also connection to a place I call the universal library of everything. I think other people know it as the Akashic records, but I'm getting better. And that's that, that connection is getting stronger and stronger. One question that um, turned my life around as I was, you know, coming towards the end of my uh, dance with depression. And I actually healed that on the boat, I just, I asked myself this question. Um, what's the longest relationship you've ever had in your life, Bob? Well, it's obvious, it's with me. Ergo, I'm the only expert on my life. Why am I listening to these fuckwits telling me there's something wrong with me? So let's have a look at this pain of depression. Let's sit with it. And then the light bulb went off. The first, the biggest ingredient was that the pain I was feeling was just a natural human loving response to having to live in such a corrupt society as a wage slave. That's the biggest ingredient. And the other ingredient was that I totally lost the belief in myself. And so on the boat, I just threw the meds, <laughs> threw the meds in the drink. Oh, but we haven't got any psychotic sharks out there. <laughs> and, Oh, for two or three weeks, I just went out and back several times a day. But it was, it was the feelings, all the feelings that I trapped over the years, getting them all out. And I just vomited them all out, splurged them all out. I was shaking and crying and swearing and sweating and, you know, but I, I just got them all out. And then it, it hit me again. I'd spent 25 years with my amazing intellect trying to think my way out, but I couldn't because depression is not of the mind. It's nothing to do with the mind. It's a wound of the soul, you know? And it was the feelings that did the healing, you know? I reckon Descartes was, was wrong when he says, I think, therefore I am, you know, because I experienced this life through my feelings, you know, it's warmth for the sunshine, you know, all that. So it's, I feel, therefore I am. So, yeah, I threw the meds away and I haven't really looked back since. Um, here's one thing that might appeal to your wellness side because, you know, I, I wish I was more like you than I am like me, you know, with the, uh, you've got so much information that I can glean from you about the body as a temple. The way I'm living at the moment, um, I treat my body more like a bouncy castle. <laughs> <It's> like... 
<laughs> but that's okay, you know, like after 25 years of feeling suicidal, um, I'm at the stage now where I'm changing my diet. I'm not living on a boat anymore because I'd lost it to Cyclone Debbie in 2017 and lost everything. She just picked it up and threw it at the land, but it never quite made it. And I'm debt free. Um, I'm happy as a clam. I smoke too much, drink too much, exercise about as much as a koala bear, but I'm content with me. And I'm, I don't compete with anybody because I've got nothing to prove. You know? And I've come to the realization that what I radiate, I create. So I consciously choose to radiate joy. Let's see. Yeah, I'm the only expert of my life. Yeah. Kiss, done that. Bouncy castle, done that. Feelings and healings. Yeah. Um, I think what's really important for me, the key word in this whole awakening transi transition, which began on the 21st of December 2012, according to the Mayans, uh, the dawning of the age of integrity. And that's the key word. Integrity is overcoming power. And wherever I look around the world, it's so obvious, you know, it's like the beast is dying and it's just getting more frantic and more people are coming out and sharing their truth and, you know, having the courage and the power to do that. You know, it would be so easy for me to start blasting psychiatrists and psychologists and the whole fraud stuff. But I found that just by focusing on the, the positive side of it, you know, my experience and what was the gift of depression, that positive energy, the negative energy will disappear because big farmers going to go down the tubes, just like big oil, you know, because they're all unsustainable, not only for environmental region, reasons, but for spiritual reasons. You know, and they say never talk about politics or religion, but, um, for me, God created man, man created religion. When I connect to source, I don't go the long way around. And, um, and I love this one. Um, religion is for those folks that are afraid of going to hell. And spirituality is for those folks that have already been there. <laughs> okay, Tom. I think that's, that's about it for now, mate. But I'd love to talk to you in future with your mates, if you'll be around table, about other aspects of personal growth and personal empowerment you know? yeah, yeah. thank you so much for this opportunity my friend there but i'd love to hear your feedback yeah well i think uh i think a lot of people will get a lot out of just hearing your story because sometimes people they don't need advice as much as they need to uh just glean experience from somebody else's experience and to feel a little bit into their world and through that they can make a lot of you know they can kind of recognize a lot of themselves and some of their own situations as well and and i think just from hearing your story people would have picked up a few kind of tips and things that they can do for themselves so it's always great when somebody's actually willing to share their what they've gone through and and how they've come through it because it just gives some other people a bit of comfort or hope or you know something along those lines well i think the thing that stands out for me and touring around Australia, I've met lots of clever, creative people, and they seem to be most susceptible to this dis-ease. Mm -hmm. It's not. So I never say I have a cure for depression because that would imply it's an illness. It's not. It's your heart slapping your mind about saying, wake up and live the person you were born to be. Mm. And I'm going to keep slapping you harder and harder and harder till you do. And it explains to me why male suicide rates are so high because for generations and generations, men have been denied access to their most powerful healing tool. And that's their feelings. Yeah. And for me, being vulnerable, being vulnerable is just a human being being human. Yeah, absolutely. Simple absolutely. as that. Yeah. I think yeah. a lot of men have reached uh, bad places because of that. And I'm one of those people. I got really sick in my early twenties. I was telling one of my friends today, it's uh, one, one of the reasons was just that I had no uh, connection to my uh, softer side, the feminine side it was all, all the masculine, all doing, all doing too much, doing the heavy stuff, doing the, uh, the hard stuff and, and enjoying it. But it's also easy. It's really easy to be the tough guy and the, uh, 
you know, the guy that is impenetrable and whatever. It's actually a lot harder to soften yourself and actually be a bit more, a bit more open to yourself and to others. And it wasn't until I managed to open myself that my energy and I got some of my health back because until then it's just, you know, it, it can drive a man to death, literally. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll give you an extreme example why, for me, there is no such thing as mental illness. And Stefan Molyneux had a great video on it on YouTube, but his whole channel's been wiped. Eight years of work, gone. But um, let's take the PTSD. Now, for me, the biggest sin, the biggest you know, mortal wound that anybody can hold is to take the knife of another living human being. But our culture programs people to believe that it's honorable to go to somebody else's country and shoot somebody that looks like you and kill them. Now that, that action, whether you carried it out yourself or you witnessed it, there is a price to pay. And the price is the pain of the behaviors that manifest in the physical because of what has happened, you know, in the, in the spiritual, in the, you know, in your heart. Because everybody knows deep down what's right and what's wrong. And it's only the programming that overrides that. that you know, that's just my observation. Yeah. And ADHD, you know, the kids in school, he's like this, you know, the last, when I was a kid, I just, I just ran everywhere. You know, I didn't want to sit down for four hours, sit still. No wonder they, they're not paying attention. They want to be out running through the forest, you know chasing wild boars or whatever. So uh, it's all bollocks. I'm sorry. Shouldn't have said that. <laughs> yeah, well, part of, it's, part of it's a lifestyle issue with the way humanity's gone, but there is a big element of that with the chemicals that, like the amount of vaccines they're putting kids these days compared to what I got, compared to what you got, is, uh, is all completely yeah. different. And, and that has a big effect on the behaviour of some of these kids as well. But part of it is, yeah, literally just boxing them in. Of course, kids are going to go a little... A little little nuts because we're not meant to be boxed in like that so no oh i don't know if i mentioned this i've got a short-term memory problem um every year i used to get whatever bug was going around you know i was just like whether it's chicken pox or mad cow disease or whatever you know or flus or colds and um until in 2015 i consciously chose to go barefoot i do not own a pair of shoes and tom i haven't had a sniffle since 2015 since i went totally barefoot yeah there you go yeah nice <laughs> nature's amazing isn't it yeah it's amazing what happens when you connect back to your uh what made you you know it's it's there to, there to help you <laughs> but yeah look i think that was great bob i really appreciate you sharing we'll um we'll definitely do another one to go into some more things and like you said maybe get a few more people on and talk a little bit more about uh even if it's just men you know just get a few men on because there's a lot that um you know, the, the world kind of says that women are disadvantaged and there has definitely been a lot of that. But you see how many men are people like my favorite comedian is Bill Burr. And he says, you know, like you can't like uh, women have a day for everything. And there's no like a, a man can just be if a man just gets a broken heart or something or whatever happens, you know, people laugh at him. They think it's hilarious. It's like I remember he said his bit in his comedy was that, you know, if somebody like offends a woman they have a whole day in a parade for him or whatever and then if a woman chops her husband's penis off and throws it in the in the uh in the dryer everyone laughs i think that's hilarious it's like there is a, a big chasm in society that that uh, for, for supporting men through their uh and like you said uh for generations and generations it's not been right for men to have feelings and so there's uh that's the more stressful society becomes the more it's important for men to be able to uh get in touch with that side and that's why things like men's sheds and men's groups are becoming more and more popular these days but i think there's still a lot of people that aren't in touch with that and who could do with you know uh something like that if there was a, a few people that wanted to get on and share a little bit about what's helped and, and that can help other people just by you know that don't want to get involved but want to sit and listen so we can certainly do that yeah well from the support groups i used to run in frio um i realized that I can't wake anybody up, mm. but the best posture for me is just to hold a space of loving acceptance and validation, you know, just via, and as I say, I've got loads of these 
bumper stickers, these little memes that have come through me. Um, and, you know, I do not come here expecting agreement for all are unique. I simply expect acceptance and validation of my own reality. And I don't know about you, but I feel things, you know, if there's a, a nasty person coming towards me, I can feel it for about a hundred yards. You know, I, I feel it, you know, oh, I don't want to go there. Barnaby, my little dog, he can do it for miles. Mm. If he lifts his little paw and starts barking, I know there's an arsehole coming around the corner. He's, <laughs> he's a long range arsehole detector. Anyway, Tom, it's been an absolute pleasure. And um, yeah, great to make a connection. And it's my intention, if all goes well, um, to end up down in New South Wales at Nightcap. Yeah, great. That's, uh, that's where I'm heading. Great. Yeah. Good spot there. Like minded souls. Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay, buddy. We'll connect again in the future, Bob. Thanks for coming on.